Okie dokie, let's do this. Welcome to another Sound webinar. How's the transmission? Can everybody hear me? Can everybody see me? Excellent, thank you for confirming. Um, today is Festival Fridays, so without further ado, uh, let's get to business, which means that I'm gonna start with doing the household notes uh, as usual, starting with the household notes first. Um, share my screen, there we go. and showtime so today is going to be um friday festival festival friday um today we're going to do case study of montreux jazz festival we have two guest lectures which i will introduce in a while but as always let's talk about zoom first because that is the communication platform that we like to use to conduct these webinars and that means that in front of you you're expected to have a window not unlike the one you see over here if you would like to know who else is joining you today all you have to do is click on the participants button, in which case a window pops up on the right side showing you your fellow attendees. We encourage you to ask questions, which I will monitor also during the session, but in order to do so in an organized fashion, we encourage you to make use of the raise hand feature. Notice that in the bottom right corner, there's a button which says raise hand, and whenever you click on that button, a blue hand icon pops up in the corner of my eye, informing me that you would like to ask a question. Now, in order to ask the question itself, we would very much like you to make use of the chat feature. So whenever you click on the chat balloon icon, the right hand window splits in half, bringing up a chat dialogue with a field at the bottom where you can enter a message. You can address this message to everyone on the call, um, or if you happen to see a friend, fellow colleague, or a family member, then you can also message that person in private. That pretty much concludes the household notes. That being said, we're also simulcasting as we speak uh, to um, Facebook Live, to the user community. Welcome to those people as well. Thank you for joining us. Um, this group is growing at a steady pace. It's currently counting 8,900 members and rising. So welcome to you as well. And that means that without further ado, I'm going to... Uh, introduce today's guest lecturer who has brought another guest so it's going to be a guest announcing a guest um jose godin once again thank you for joining us Meyer sounds technical support specialist are you with me i am Hello. excellent Hello. excellent how are you doing sir uh very good <laughs> awesome very good two hours sleep from building a presentation tonight but very good awesome i will <laughs> awesome. stop sharing my screen i will stop sharing my screen and it's all yours, and I'm very curious about the guest that you brought today. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, are you seeing my screen? Yes, sir. I can see your screen. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> welcome, welcome to this presentation about Monte Jazz Festival. It's uh, I obviously I, uh, for those of you who don't know the festival, I, I, there's no chance I can speak about all the festival over an hour. So I'm going to limit myself to the main venues, uh, to the top three main venues. And um, so uh, one, this is me. Uh, I'm very proud of my, my past picture that when I was 16 years old, uh, I lead my personal technical support on, on site uh, during the festival. So uh, I get help from a bunch of colleagues, which is great. Um, I lead the designs for all the venues, the 16 venues this year, or they, they should have been 16 venues this year. And uh, then I change my hat and I, and I go to the jazz club mixing as a front of house engineer. Um, unfortunately, I've been at the festival on two different, date, different dates. I've been 12 years inside the festival and I've been 16 years around the festival, meaning that I worked for, for a company that was providing uh, equipment for the festival um it related to the festival and then i joined the festival crew 12 years ago 12 years ago <laughs> now now jose wh what do you have for breakfast because if i look at those photos you haven't aged a day it's like <laughs> <laughs> well, to fountain of truth, youth i don't eat breakfast <laughs> <laughs> ah and it helps in the morning yeah uh, especially during the festival um Today we have Amanda Davis with us, and Amanda uh, was at the festival last year with uh, Janelle Monet. 
she's mixing from a house for her, which is also mixing uh, two other artists, which she's uh, touring with and product, uh, doing production manager. Uh, she's also a proud sound girl contributor and mentor. Amanda, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Great. It's great awesome. to hear you. It's great to have you. Glad to be um, here. <laughs> Welcome. So we'll start. I uh, will start about the history of the festival, and then we'll move to Stravinsky, which is the venue where we, uh, um, where you mixed last year. And so we'll be interested in your workflow. Cool. Uh, so this year should have been today is the day of the uh, should have been the start of the fifty fourth Monte Jazz Festival. Um, today would be right now would be finishing sound checks and going for food. Uh, before starting the show um, around 20, um, 20 p 8 p.m. Um, so it's not happening this year. The festival is releasing some of it, its archives, um, but um, this year is not happening. So it's only 53 years of music. And I have to point out that Myerson has been uh, partnering with the festival for 33 years. So on the left side, you see the first um, Poster for the festival 1967, the first festival, and I can't remember the name of the person playing the saxophone, but he played at the 50th anniversary. So this gentleman here on the on the on the on the first poster of the festival was invited back the, for the 50th anniversary and played in the club uh, in 2017 for the anniversary of the festival. So it all happened. Oh, sorry. Today, the festival announced, and I just made this other slide. Today, the festival announced that they are going to release uh, every day. They're going to release uh, in streaming new or unreleased um, archives that you can see here. So uh, go to the website. They, um, because the festival is not happening, but they archive everything. All these archives are available on the on the internet, and so uh, this is the this is the link, or you can find the link on the website. This is the schedule. Uh, for each day of the week of these next two weeks. Hey Jose, uh, could it be could it be that the saxophone player was Charles Lloyd? I think so. I was googling at hyperspeed while you were saying it, and I was like, I, I, you know, I've got technology to answer this question. I think it was Charles Lloyd. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, it rings a bell. It's it, not hundred percent sure, but yes, I think so. Awesome. That was a that was a nice that was a cool show. Uh, so it all happened because of Claude Knobs. This guy, um, this guy here, he uh, he was he trained as a cook and uh, was hired at the tourism office of the city of Montreux. And he was hired to diversify and make and make Montreux noun, um, where uh, which he somehow succeeded by building a jazz festival. So uh, the first year, it was very, uh, he'd invite the artists at, the, at his house, he'll cook for them. Um, it was all, all about relationships. It still is a lot about relationships. There's this legacy now that the festival wants to welcome everybody as, as, as the best as they can. And uh, so it's, that's some of his legacy and there's a couple others. But uh, so Clone Ups passed a couple of years ago and we're trying to, or at least people that are responsible in the festival, we're trying to, keep this legacy and the ideas he had. Uh, that's the guy that uh, would show up at four in the morning when we were finishing the tuning and, and ask if he can play music, if he can bring a, his tape player and, and, and play music while we're all looking forward to go to sleep. Uh, and then we eventually listened to music in, in a hallway uh, with him because, because it, he just enjoyed listening to music and being with us. So, um, so he's missed. Uh, and so we're trying to uh, keep going all the all the ideas he had in one of the venues is exactly uh, uh, the vision he had uh, that we'll see one of the things that he did uh, was getting the archives so each show is recorded and each show is stored in in his chalet <laughs> um, so everything is recorded and that has been protected by unesco a couple of years ago so um, the best way i heard it was by the american lawyer of the festival that said that even if the Alliance invade uh, the earth, the, the archives of the festival, the music that has been played at the festival is protected, should be protected. Um, yeah, this is, this, is, this is part of the humanity now. Uh, and so all these archives still exist. The, for the video people here, uh, the festival has been filmed in HD since 1990, 
three. So, if, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just curious. Are these two tracks or are these multi multi tracks? Uh, so it, it all evolved with technology um, as as it was available. The first ones are uh, two tracks. Then it evolved to multi tracks as soon as it could. Um, and then uh, right now we are right now we produce multi tracks, uh, stereo mixes, five point one mixes at the same time of each show, plus the video recording. So the video is. All the cameras are, are, are recorded, and then the, and then there's the, 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 sh the final cut is recorded as well. So yeah, it's a massive amount of data. Uh, so Montreux is located in Switzerland. It's right here on the on this in the center of Europe. Uh, so Montreux uh, happens right next to Lake Geneva or Lac Léman. And for those of you who attended the Fête de Vigneron uh, presentation, the blue dot here represents where the Fête de Vigneron is happening. So last year. Uh, you can, um, last year within uh, six kilometers, uh, there was a thousand Myerson speakers and um, you, you might recognize Martin Reich on the, on the right side, on the left side of the picture. Martin was leading, um, was the lead sound engineer for Fête de Vigneron and is also, and we've also been spotted in the Montreux Jazz Club. Uh, he's also managing the for Montreux Jazz Festival. So we had a very good relationship. Uh, and that was, the, Nana, when I was building the, this presentation, it, it reminded me how crazy it was to uh, finish building and tuning the Fête de Vignon and then move to Montreux, do uh, three weeks of festival and then move back to the Fête de Vignon for the 20, uh, 20 shows or three weeks that happened. Uh, there was no break. So it's, um, it's, been, it's been a gr great collaboration. So the both of us have <coughs> been uh, spotted in, in these two places. And yeah, it was a massive effort. So this is what happened. This is last uh, summer, about the same date. Um, Montreux is happening on the shore of, the, of Lake Geneva or the Lac Léman. This is, in front of you is the casino. It's the new casino. Um, that's the city and the festival is happening on the left side of the picture where I cannot point because our friends disabled the pointing picture. Uh, but the festival is now happening. It used to happen in this area here, uh, if you see my mouse. Yes, we see your mouse. Cool. And then the, the festival moved, migrated to this area here um, in 1997. So 1967, 1968, they need a venue. And the only place that is big enough, that has ballroom big enough, is the casino. So uh, the festival is happening in the casino. There's a lot of music around it. But the, the main stage is one stage. The main stage is inside that casino. And in 1972, as, every, uh, as a lot of people know, um, Frank Zappa was playing in the festival and somebody fired a, a, a flare gun inside the building um, and it burned the place to the ground. And at the same time, Deep Purple was playing the next day and, and uh, they wanted to record their show, uh, which they couldn't now because they were in the audience and, uh, and, and, and watched the building disappear. So uh, they wrote this song called Smoke on the Water that explained the story. Really? And then, uh, and then they, they went into the hotel, uh, to the hotel across the street, and they recorded, instead of recording the show, they recorded the, the whole album into the, to the, in, in that hotel and then um, made it to, uh, to a record. So 1972. Casinos burned down, it's catastrophe for the festival. It's, it's good luck for Deep Purple uh, that write this song. Um, and then the casino, casino is rebuilt over two years. Uh, they have temporary venue. And then this is the new, what we call the new casino because it still exists now. Uh, so instead of having this super high roof casino, they, made, um, this, they had the super idea to make a very low ceiling uh, casino, which, which was a nightmare. Um, so that's, that's, that's the new casino how it looked like back in the day in 1991. Uh, and then in 1993, the city of Montreux opened the Montreux Music and Convention Center and uh, the festival migrated there because they had more rooms available so they could provide uh, different styles, different genres for each uh, room. So um, the festival moved in 1993 and it's been hosted there since then. 
And so as you can see on this picture, well, this is the building. We are going to move inside the building, but um, there is a lot of things happening outside. So everything by the, the shore lake is, um, is food stands. There's a venue behind the trees on the left. Um, uh, there's actually two venues on the, on the left, uh, which are free. Uh, almost everything outside is free. All the music outside is free. And so there's a lot of activity going on uh, at night there, and it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, place to be, as you can see on the right picture. So a couple numbers for 2019, because 2020 uh, is starting today. Um, 2019, we had 250,000 visitors. Uh, it's 16 days of festival, so it, we start on Friday. We end on the Saturday, two weeks later. Uh, 16 days of festival uh, every day. Um, 380 concerts. Of them, 250 are free, uh, happening around the festival. Uh, we are looking at, uh, they've, been, they've been nice to us. They, they, they shrink down from 16 stages to 11 stages. Six of these stages are free, uh, 55 food and beverage, beverage points. And the goal, Claude, wanted to have music at all times. He wanted to have music all day long for two weeks. and um, well, the city wasn't too happy about it. So, so the, the, the limitations now are, we start with, at 11 and sometimes there is even a couple of venues that might start at 10 uh, until 5 a.m. the next morning. So uh, uh, if you show up in Montreal around 11, around 12, uh, there will be music available and there will be music until 5 a.m. So you can, you can spend the whole day uh, around the case uh, listening to music for free. Uh, and if you have a, ticket, then you, you might want to go inside. Uh, for us in the technical department, it, it means three days of setup. Uh, so in three days, we need to bring up all the audio. All the audio is brought up in three days. Um, that's uh, for 2019, uh, sorry, for 2020. Uh, as far as I know, there was 443 loudspeakers of 32 different models. Uh, this is what I know. Now, there's a lot of different companies around that bring extra speakers. There's, there's events that I'm not entirely aware of or totally in control. Uh, so, they, they might be, you might see more speakers if you count all of them, but um, that's, that's what I'm aware of, 443 loudspeakers. And that represents 32 models over, over the history of, of uh, the company. Uh, so, this is the Stravinsky going up. Um, then uh, 18 Galileo Callisto Galaxy processors. Stravinsky has been using AVB networks for two years now. Um, so we can have remote access. Uh, Digico is a main sponsor of the festival as well. So they bring in 22 consoles of seven different models. Um, as, a, as a front house engineer, we had to transition to the Digico consoles back in the day uh on the sd8 when it was still a prototype and so everything was very new to us um and then they, we could we could see the company grow into uh, having all these seven different models they do support on site so there's a there's you can program your consoles over there and if you have a problem they will, they will come over and help you um the other main sponsor is sure uh i didn't even try to figure out the amount of microphones that are at the festival so it's nearly infinite um, we even had a touring artist uh, that is endorsed by Shure uh, arrive and one of his, his microphone is broken. They swapped his microphone and they said he could keep it. Uh, that's the way it works. You, you request a, a crazy unknown, unknown microphone and they will bring it to you. It's, um, it's a super impressive support. Uh, as, as well as they manage the 168 frequencies we have on site. Uh, because we, very long ago, uh, because the rooms, the venues are in the same building, um, one day we, ev we eventually ended up with a singer who had her microphone on the same frequency uh, than Carlos Santana's guitar uh, when he started the solo. So all of a sudden, all of a sudden, everybody's sitting in the room, and it's a quiet show with a singer. And then the next thing they know, they have a Santana solo showing up. Uh, so uh, that that yelled to some uh, RF coordination after that. Shredding the vocals. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. 
Uh, I see you're looking closely at this picture. Do you have a question about this picture? No, I was just, I was just, I'm, you know, I've, I've got glasses. Sometimes I need to lean, I need <laughs> okay. to lean over to see um, in detail. I'll take this opportunity to thank Skynet. Skynet is, is the biggest rental company, provide, is the biggest uh, sound provider in the festival. Uh, and so we, there's a lot of work we do, uh, we collaborate a lot. And so um, I'd just like to thank them here because we, I see their cases here. Uh, it's, it's great collaboration that we could build over the years. There's a lot of trust and it gives us a lot of flexibility and speed uh, because the festival is happening every year. So this, now we have this hive knowledge of uh, everybody remembers a couple of things and so we can just sit down and, and be like, okay, how did we do this last year? And then we can move on to improve things. Uh, but big, big shout out to uh, Yvon that has been here for years and, and helping a lot, Nicola, who, uh, who um, manages the company. Um, this is the layout of the festival. So uh, in 2019, so the main venue is the Auditorium Stravinsky, which is a classical hall. And it's on the top of this building. So it's on the fifth floor of this building. And, and uh, yeah, it's a, so it's a crazy fit. You can only access by elevator with the equipment. So there's this bottleneck where you have to park a semi-trailer in the street, unload it into a, a lift, and then lift the whole thing into the venue. This is the bottleneck of loading in in the morning in this venue. And we'll, we'll get back to the timing with... Uh, Amanda, but uh, this has a huge impact on the on the team uh, every day. So, Amanda, uh, did did your touring schedule allow you to visit any of the other venues or to attend any of the other shows? Yes, um, I was actually like very excited when um, Jose was explaining everything because I was I started to remember where <laughs> I was going and I went to like. There's a, like a the club. I think it's like a hip hop. I went and saw a couple of hip hop acts, and then walking <laughs> around to like the food trucks and stuff. We really indulged. <laughs> it and, was and, like and, one nice. of the best times. And Montreux is during like right before my birthday too, so it was it was really cool. Cool, <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. So the second venue is the Jazz Lab here. Uh, is this one here? It's it's co-located in the building. So it's a, it's a different floor, it's just collocated. Um, it's 2,000 people. And then uh, the third main venue is the Jazz Club, uh, which is meant as a jazz, jazz club. It's in, in a separate building, 600 seats. Now there's the Listo Club, which runs all night, uh, which probably uh, had all these hip hop hacks. Uh, there's a terrace here. And then outside here, we have the Music in the Park, which is a... a um, 3,000 people uh, area or park and has a free stage on it. There's a couple extra things. There's Montreal Jazz Train, so you could board a train and there's a band playing in it. And there's Montreal Jazz Boats that will cruise over the lake every weekend with, um, with uh, two venues, one, one at the top floor and one at the bottom floor. Um, and in 2019, there was an extra show by Elton John uh, that happened in the stadium in the stadium north of the city. That was an exception, but you can see here on the top left, 15,400 people. That was the capacity of the stadium, but that was an exception uh, for that concert. So today I'm going to speak about the, these three venues and we are, we are going to start with the Stravinsky Auditorium right away uh, with the small arrow. So this is where we're going right now. Uh, it's a classical hall. It's made for classical music and sorry for the pixels. Uh, but it's the best picture I could find. This is the, this is the room in the, its natural state. And it's quite a problematic for us because when we want to uh, put loudspeakers and reinforce music in there, uh, we want to have it a little bit more dry. So prior to the festival, uh, well, we've been measuring this venue from, for a long time now and uh, we ask for absorption. And so prior to the festival, it's a two week process this room is transformed with, um, with absorption so that the, the, uh, we can dampen the, the walls, the, the, the wood walls. The resonators on top are removed, uh, have been removed now. And the, the um, stage is configured so that uh, it's in the final, well, the festival position. So this is how it looks like when, when the festival is happening. You can see the curtains under the balcony 
you can see the absorption material in front of the balcony. Uh, and then on the right side, you can see on the right side, there is a, there's a row of glass windows and these glass windows are covered by curtains so that we can uh, absorb the, the energy coming off of the, of the stage. So that's now in festival mode. That's in 2000, this is 2012, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's always amazing to put a sound system in a room whose job description is to amplify the acoustic sound. That's always, that's always a winner combo. Yeah. Well, if nobody, uh, let me check the attend. <laughs> so the joke is they rebuilt the room and they said we improved the acoustics. So uh, we were pretty uh, scared about that because what does we improve the acoustics mean? Uh, so we went back. Uh, during the season, so I think it, I think it was early January, we went back and took uh, acoustical measurements, and what we realized was the RT60 in the low me in the lows and the mid range actually had decreased. So technically, it's improved. The acoustics were m much more improved for us because we didn't have to fight with um, a mass of absorption to to reduce this this effect. So um, technically, the room has improved for for our needs with the years. Um, in the yes, I, is, I have a question. I noticed on your picture that front of house was a, fur, a bit further back than when I was there last year. Does that, did that have anything moving front of house? Did it have anything to do with um, the acoustics? The, fi uh -huh. the picture you showed um, that yeah. showed the venue set up in festival mode. This one? Yes. Yeah. No, so so the front of house was in the same place last year. What you see, it's the fish eye effect of the um, of the uh, of the picture. Gotcha. Because you uh, you can't be you're not you're not under the balcony. In fact, uh, in fact, we measured that 4K is is resonating on the balcony edge, and so that's a problem every year. So we had to dampen it, and so um, so that's something that we have to check every year. So uh, I'm I'm pretty positive we checked that last year. So. It's in the same position. The other thing is that the cable runs uh, are there's cables. So everything everything in this room is on hydraulic, so you can you can move uh, you can move the floor. But there's only a couple of places where we have power and where we can put uh, fiber optics. And so the front of house is, is defined by this position. So uh, so yeah, it feels like it's it's more in uh, more in the front, but it's yeah, actually, it looks like I didn't. It feels like not a lot of that uh, crowd space was, it feels like I was closer to the stage, basically, yeah. but maybe it's just the, the view of this picture. No, you were, uh, you, uh, if I remember correctly, you were where the, um, what's the console, the front console is, mm -hmm. the forward console is placed. So, so I'm curious because um, the next photo shows an, a, a seated audience and Amanda, yes. during, during, during our preparation talk, uh, I was under the assumption that you attended a show here the day yes. prior, the prior to your concert, and then the audience was still seated. Is there like a big change when the audience goes from seated to standing? Does the room offer more? Uh, uh, does the room uh, admit more people when they are standing versus uh, whether they are seated? So yeah, that's correct. That's that's uh, the purpose of this picture is to show there's two configurations. One is seated, and you can see the VL, the the balcony behind is the VIP seating. So the VIP seating in the balcony is always seated. The the seats are bolted. But the, the floor under the balcony and in front is uh, can be seated, can be in a seated configuration for some artists and is standing for others. So, uh, so when Amanda showed up the day before, uh, Anita Baker was playing and she and it was a seated configuration. And so and the next step for a channel, it was standing configuration, for example. So, yeah. Is that a major a change? Or is it some, I mean, the, the, the second day you were mixing, so maybe, you know, your focus was on, on, on mixing the show, but, or, or is it a very subtle difference when you go from seating to standing uh, in terms of perceived acoustics? It's not, it's not as subtle. It is a, a dramatic dis difference simply because the people soak up the sound. And then if you have seats, especially if they're cloth seats, that plays into the acoustics as well. Right. So it, it, 
it varies. Um, but like when I went to the show the night before, I'm a fan of Anita Baker, but I also went to like do research and, and see what the room would sound like. But I knew that it would be different because w- once I got there, because it was seats um, there and, you know, not just uh, the standing room only. But the difference is, you know, it just depends on, you know, the crowd and the if the seats are cloth or not, because that, that brings into a whole other element of acoustics. Cool. Thank you. Back to you, Jose. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, well, I haven't quantified it also. So to answer your question, I haven't quantified. We tried to move away from this configuration because it's taxing on the crew. Uh, because you need to change changing configuration is a is a bit much bigger step than bringing only seats and and so uh, it's been taxing so um, the the way of I'm gonna talk about later how the rooms are organized in terms of of music but there's a, there's a reason for that and we're trying to now we're trying to convince that we should stop doing seated configuration in Swarovski because it it is taxing to to everyone working there um, so yeah I'm going to show uh, Tiny bit of the prediction, some predictions we did for the venue. This is showing the 3D, a 3D model. Um, we use um, 12 layers per side. In this case, when Leo came out, we were using Leos, and then, then before that, we were using Milos. Um, but right now, we're using 12 Lions. And so this is the predictions at 8K. This is the high frequency predictions. And at tuning, uh, for some reason, our friends in the lighting department prefer to work during the day, so we have the whole night for tuning after the setup. And at tuning, we keep the we keep the the, the motor controls for the or we keep the remote controls for the motors, so that if you look in the back here, you can see this is a glass this is a glass window, and so what we we look into very detail. Actually, we play some measurement microphone. And we aim the sp- we aim the PA a little bit too high, measure the high frequencies, and then bring down the the array. Well, change the, the the angle of tilt of the array down so that we know exactly where the top the high frequencies are hitting. So we the good thing for us is we have time to do that uh, because it's happening it's happening at night and it's. It's a self-inflicted pain to to want to spend eight hours or seven hours measuring a sound system, but but in this case we can be super precise because we move the array into position into the exact position we want to have, uh, trying to avoid all all these reflections, but hitting the last row super precisely, uh, and then in, on the floor we can we we can manage it a little bit differently. This is the left and right together. Uh, so seen from above, you can see the shape of the room. And actually, if you look at the if you look at the arrays, uh, the arrays are towed in five degrees. And the reason they're towed in five degrees is remember the curtains. Uh, we're trying to avoid this wall here because this is this is a wood wall. But under the balcony here are curtains, so we can trap the high frequencies underneath here. Whereas here we we won't, we'll never be able to do that. So what we're trying to do is. Towing to the arrays is slightly in, uh, which is I think the exact number is 5.5 degrees, uh, just to avoid this wall here, and then we'll fill it with front fills uh, to avoid nasty reflections of that uh, wooden wall. And uh, that's a tricky thing to realize with riggers. It takes a, it takes some some effort and aiming, but uh, um, we are quite hopefully yeah we're quite quite successful every year. So did you use the V plate? We're not using the plates no, because the the, um, the chains have to go through through uh, t- through an element in the roof that is uh, too small, and we can't fit a V plate in there. Okay, thank you. So, so no, it's um, it's all by hand. Uh, that's the front fill system, and the front fill system is a mix of is a mix of UPA on the outside and UPQ on the inside, and the reason for that is we want to create this this shape. That is louder in feels louder inside, but actually distance to cover to the center is bigger. So that's the UPQ's job, and then the UPA is covering the outside, which is a, a smaller uh, coverage. So the the good thing is we have this instead of having a, a, a curved coverage, we have a f- flat facing coverage, and uh, it matches with the, with the PA pretty good. 
Um, so this is a mix that we use. It's, it's the, what we call the infill outfill on each side of the venue. There are lift fields, but some, because of the, of the TV and because of the production, uh, they most of the time ask us to remove the, the lip fills. So this is, the, this is what we use to fill in. And then sometimes we're asked, this is left and right at the same time, sometimes we get asked to remove them. And so we have a center fill, and this is the coverage of the center fill that, we, uh, that is aiming down. So this is obviously shifting the image up, but we can still bring energy to the front rows uh, by keeping the, the visuals clean for our friends in the camera uh, department. And so that's a tricky thing. And so this, this center is separated in all, so all channels are separated because it's pointing down and it scares everybody when they show up the first time. I don't know about you, Amanda, but when people walk in the venue, they look at the center and they go me. like, wow, this is gonna spill on the stage like crazy. Yeah, it definitely um, brought me some concern with uh yeah. especially with with an artist like janelle some artists just stay still you know <laughs> but like the janelle is not that artist so a center cluster is always something that is a concern of mine when i walk into a venue yeah so you did what you didn't know at the time was uh we actually aim again like like on, on the top with the with the lions on, on the balcony we aim these uh with measurements so we are we can I, I can easily guarantee that you have 6 dB less than the front row. Mm -hmm. Oh, you already have 6 dB of gain before feedback, uh, compared to compared to the front rows. But right. there's no way for you to know when you walk in a venue and look extreme. So all boxes are separated, and then you can control. It's it's up to everyone's uh, uh, everyone to change that. You can mute the lower box, or you can EQ it differently, and it will leave them all separate because that that's, that makes uh, us for an easier day. So Amanda, um, for, for this particular show, how did you deliver your mix? Do you do left, right, or do you left, right subs or left, right subs and fills or, or how did you go about it in this venue? Uh, yes, I, I typically uh, zone it out. I try to make it easy for everyone. Like um, Jose was just explaining the different zones of left, right in the center cluster. So, and for me to have as much control as possible, I like to just send out ma uh, matrices and send out a left, right, whatever is available to me, I put on matrix. I zone it out just like the system engineer does so I could have as much control, especially when I see it come into a venue and I have a center cluster, I wanna be able to do what I need to do to reduce any type of feedback or anything. Um, right. So for this one, I did left, right, sub, um, the outfills and the center cluster. And do you do you um, feed the matrix the same stems, or do the matrix stems also contain different stems? Um, the matrix is fed from my left, right. Um, so I go into um, I use a Digico SD12, so I just go into the the matrix window and just dip out about six dB from the fields, the center cluster, and the uh, subs, just so I can get a, a good level of everything. And then once I do my tuning, I also, well, my tuning is on, since it's fed through my left, right on the lake, um, I have those zones on the lake as well. The difference on the left, right, sub, center, and uh, front fields. So I would EQ um, the center field after I do my full tuning of the full PA. If I have a center cluster, then I would do that once, I, once we're up and running and done a line check and my mic is live. So I can I EQ that center cluster differently than everything else, just so to make sure that I have no feedback if you know, microphone gets thrown around and things like that. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Jose, by all means, continue, sorry. No, no problem. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's great to hear Amanda's workflow. Um, here on the picture, you have the center subwoofer. So we, Usually we, we have the left, right 1100 um, subwoofer behind the main race. It's easier, easier for timing, it's great. That's the other thing, the, we, can, we manage the crossover beam. So the interaction between the lions and the 1100 at the crossover frequency, the, this beam that is going to be formed going forward, uh, we change it by, by having the capacity, remember during tuning to 
uh, access the motor so we can we can raise or lower the subwoofers. So generally, we start with the subwoofer in the lower position, and we raise them until we we get the the lobe we wanted the crossover frequency. As a small detail, um, and then Tom. Tom asked what speaker is used for a center field. We used Le both Linas and Leopard. Uh, both work. It really depends on the availability. Uh, so that's the subwoofers behind. And then in the front rows, because speakers are hanging and we get a lot of directivity in the 1100s, we wanted to keep directivity. And so we've added 900s under the stage in a calibrated array. So these 900s under the stage are trying to uh, give pressure, especially when we have hip hop shows or, um, or electronics, electronic music show or EDM shows. Uh, we want, they, the people expect to have more sound pressure in the center, uh, in the front. So we are, this is a trick we use. We, we have a, we can throttle, we, we throttle them um, back and forth depending on the show. And it gives us this extra uh, energy in the front that we can, we can troll when you have Kraftwerk, for example, playing there, and then the next day you have a you have a symphony. You can just you you can just troll them up and down, and and they fully integrate. In the tuning process, it's a little bit more complicated because we have to make to keep this capacity in time to move up and down again. But uh, that's the center. That's the center subwoofers. That's what you do, and that's the main subwoofers uh, covering the whole venue. And so here's a pictures. So here's the picture of the system fully lit and ready to go before a show. Um, the, there's five melodies per side as side fields, and they also, also hang in there. You can see everything is super tiny. Everything goes in, in small places. Uh, we, have to, we have to work a lot about how, you, how to integrate all the elements, like the screens, uh, make sure the screens aren't reflective, um, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's, there's a lot of integration work in the, in the process that again, Scanner is doing uh, I was just, I was, as I was mentioning. Um, so, and with that, I'll, now I'm gonna bring Amanda for real and we'll be interested to, to hear about your workflow. So when you show up in this venue, well, you mix in this venue, but uh, how, how do you, what do you start when you arrive here, uh, except um, sneaking in and listening to Anita Baker? Um, <laughs> We, we, what, what are the, what's the tools are you using? And, and because we know you, you were in Roskilde the week before. So yeah. you arrived from an outdoor festival into this indoor venue. And so how did which that go? Is, which is usually the preference because outside, especially a festival like Roskilde, you don't get a sound check or anything. So it's just kind of a throw and go and you have to... Um, you know, pray that everything works. <laughs> but with Montreux, we, we were able to load in. It was, it was as if it was, a, you know, our venue for the day um, on tour. So that was, that process was great. Um, as you, on this picture, you can see the lake sitting there on the lid um, and my laptop where I play my, to my playlist of tuning songs. So that process, um, I have three songs that I play. I start with a, a Oliver remix of Mayor Hawthorne's Her Favorite Song. And uh, just to get a, a good I, an idea of what the PA is doing um, generally and all the way around. And then I will play uh, Toto's I Will Remember to really start digging in and getting the, the PA to sound like I needed to sound. Um, if you go, if you guys can, if you want to like zoom in on that picture, you can see like it wasn't a lot, yeah, that I I needed to do because um, Jose did a great job of tuning the system. Um, it's just a few things that you know I need to get the system to where I needed to sound for the type of show I'm doing, which is usually. A, a lot of it depends on the room in the system because Janelle has a wide uh, range of genres that she goes through in her show. We go from pop to straight up R&B to rock. We end the show with a rock song. So uh, I have to be uh, really aware of uh, what, what songs and what's going on as far as what frequencies to bring out or whether to take out. Um, so I listen to Toto and then 
to get my low end right, I um, listen to Bruno Mars's uh, That's What I Like. I think that's the name of the song. Something like that. I never can remember names of things or lyrics or anything. Um, and that helps me get, that song helps me get my low end where I need to be as far as um, style of music that I'm doing, especially with the R&B and uh, pop stuff. The bass, the synth bass on that song really is uh, is out there and gives you a good uh, understanding of what your low end is doing. Um, so from there, I, uh, I, I multi-track all my shows. So after I get the PA sounding a little bit, you know, I think I'm in a good space, then I'll play back a show um, to see what the band is actually going to sound like through the PA after I've done my tuning. And then I do, if I need to, I do some tweaks there um, until the band actually gets into the uh, venue. And before, even before the band gets in the venue, though, like I mentioned earlier, if there's a center cluster, I ring out my microphone, um, the, my main microphone, especially um, w with everything, too, because Janelle ends the show in the audience. Like, she comes out. And so I don't want any feedback. I don't want anything, to ha anything like that to happen. So I have my A2 um, just speak into her mic and yell into it and just hold it up like directly against the the PA and everything so I can ring out anything that may happen when she decides to come out into the audience. Um, and then sound check starts and I get a real uh, idea of what the show is going to be like. Um, it very it, it's going to be, I, I am still being aware that it's going to be different because no one, it's an empty room and we're dealing with, you know, solid uh, material like the wood and everything that's in there and in a venue that is not actually built for live bands, you know, someone to hit on a live snare or anything. So I, uh, I get, I tend to be not as aggressive with my EQing during sound check because I know it's probably going to change once people get in there. So I just dip it out to kind of make it comfortable. So it's not as um, abrasive. Um, if I have to, um, you know, cause people are, there's management sometimes or others that are like worried about what it sounds like during sound check and just not aware that, you know, what I, I'm doing my job and trying to make it, you know, what, get it to where we need to be for when the people come in. So I try to keep a balance of, of and keeping a mental note of what I'm dipping out versus when what I would need to pull back when uh, the people get inside the venue. Uh, what else? Yeah, that's it. So then once the band is going and even Janelle's on stage or my artist was on stage, I walk around the venue with my lake tablet and make sure that every zone is giving me what I need. Um, and like I said, like Jose tuned the room so well, it, it, I didn't have to do much. I was walking around just enjoying sound check basically. And uh, yeah, we got the show up and going. So <clears throat> thank you. I have, I have to say that I get almost eight hours to tune the room. So I, I can't take, too much credit for that because probably everybody could do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I, I know I can't do it. This is why I'm not a system. Well, I get time. I get time. <laughs> so I can try for a long time. So, so you said that you you exercise restraint during sound check in an empty room or when you're when you're voicing the system. Um, because can you tell a little bit about the changes that you anticipate once the audience comes into the room? What are the kind of corrections that you keep yourself from making while the room is still empty in anticipation of things changing once it's occupied? Yeah, so I, 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 I use restraint, but I still, I'm a little aggressive with my volume, even when, if I have a, you know, a DB limit, um, because I want to, this is the time to do it. I want to see what I, what the PA can do and what I can do until you know it's just a bit too much so 
I will probably say in an empty room like this, 2K will probably ring out more so when it's empty than when the people get in. So I will probably dip that out maybe 3 dB as opposed to 5 or 6 dB because I know that that frequency is probably just kind of, you know, a, a little bit aggressive only because the room is empty. So that's why on that picture, you, my, I keep my lake close. So when the people get in the show gets started, I can quickly access it and say, oh, I'm missing a little of that 2K or whatever the top end that I brought out because it was just a bit aggressive for me. I'll just bring, I'll slowly bring it back until it, it needs to, uh, until it sits well in the mix. Awesome. Yeah, one of one of the things you definitely experienced is um, the air conditioning cannot keep up with temperature with people in this room. So what, uh, you probably experienced the fact that we have to cool the venue very low in the 17 degrees C to 20 degrees C uh, so that the audience, when the audience is in, uh, especially if we have a very big show or very well attended show, then the temperature is going to raise and there's there's nothing the uh, air conditioning system can do about it so uh, right. this 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 probably have an effect on, on your mix as well yeah because if, if not then there's humidity like i said earlier with ross gilda all that like affects the sound and um and how it reaches the the ear of the audience you know the humidity really weirdly changes you know what we're what we're perceiving to hear agreed awesome okie dokie um so we'll get back to you in a, a while because we're also interested to hear about your role as a mentor and what you do within the community for uh, women in the industry so i'd love to hear about that um in a couple of minutes cool Is that my turn? Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm just realizing this presentation is going to explode the one hour schedule. So, um, <laughs> well, so that, that's going to be fun. Step up. Yeah, you'll blame me. Well, you'll blame me afterwards. Um, so yeah, so that's, um, was it your said no, it's a different ST12. Uh, so yeah, let's move along. So let's move to the next venue. Thank you, Amanda. Um, uh, let's move to the next venue, the Montreal Jazz Lab. It's downstairs. It's uh, it's more of clubbing. And um, while I have this slide on the screen, let me just explain the difference between Stravinsky Jazz Lab and Jazz Club. So the Auditorium of Stravinsky was the main venue for headliners. And then the new generation of musicians was placed in the Jazz Lab, which was called the Miles Davis Hall back in the day. And then Claude Knobs wanted to bring back a central place to the jazz and by creating a venue dedicated to that. And so the jazz club was born in the, inside the building. And what happened is the, the people that were programming the artists in the different venues were un unconsciously starting to compete. So they were, they were trying to have the biggest name in their venue for the day. And it wasn't really a good situation because you'd ended up be, you, you'd ended up because of, of scheduling and touring, you'd end up with two headliners in two different rooms, uh, which wasn't very good because then the next days you, you, you wouldn't find so on. So, so they redistributed the, 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 um, the uh, venues. And so the uh, Stravinsky Auditorium is doing the headliners, most of the headliners, depending on the size. The jazz lab is doing the new generation, and the jazz club is specializing in clubs, in jazz and, and um, uh, acoustic music. Uh, so that has been redistributed, and it, it had a, this very good effect. And this is why I was saying that we're now trying to avoid seating in, in Stravinsky, uh, because we have this other venue that is, in, that is the jazz club that allows exactly for that. Um, and then there's something in the chat. Okay, so let's move into the jazz lab. Um, this is a, it's going to be very quick. It's this venue holds 2000 and 2000 people. Uh, it's, we have 10 leopards per side. Uh, and the interesting part about the design, there, there's an interesting part in the design process for this venue, 
that is uh, it's very low ceiling there's no weight you can put on the on the ceiling well there's very high weight limitations and what was there before was mica um, and then when the mica wasn't available we ended up having milos and if you know the mica quite well it's 1.15 meters wide and it's about 70 kilos so we had about between 800 and 900 kilos per side uh, for a for a width of about 1.15 1.20 meters and so it's taking a lot of real estate in the visual picture and when leopard came out john meyer gives us two challenges one is can we do a sound system natively outside in the park so the first venue in the venue uh, music in the park which is outside <clears throat> john meyer felt that we could do it natively without any eq without any processing and we accepted the challenge and so we we took care of that by again making sure that we can move the elements and so the tuning is happening not in the galileo or in the galaxy but it's happening is happening by moving the subwoofers around by moving the loudspeakers so we had to set up set it up so that when we were taking measurements and we had decisions to make then we had the capacity to move the elements so that we wouldn't use delay, we wouldn't use EQ, we wouldn't use gain to put all the elements together. Now, the other thing that John Meyer said was, we should put Leopard in the lab. And that had everyone take a step back. We were like, this is, Leopard is too small to go in the lab. And he goes, well, I think, I think we can. The, ad the advantage of having a Leopard inside the lab is it's less wide, 68 centimeters, about half half the Milo, well, less than half the, the, the width of the Milo. And it's, and it's super light. This is 300 kilos. So we, we divided the weight by three and we divided the width, the width by about two. So uh, that was very, very practical. What we weren't expecting is how sound would improve in the, in the room. And it's now totally, uh, I think it improved massively, but it's my personal taste. This graphic is, our, is, the, is showing the regulation for level in Switzerland. Switzerland limits the, 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 the loud music exposure to 100 dB LAEQ over 60 minutes. So the festival is required to measure sound pressure level in every venue and, and give the data to the authorities who will analyze if we, if we uh, are going over this limit. So in this case, so what we took as a reference is we took the data for the past three years. We averaged the data to have an idea of how loud people would be mixing in this venue. And based on that, we could specify the sound, the, the, the sound system. So we knew Milo had a lot of power available and we were afraid that Leopard wouldn't have enough power. So with this, we could, real, we could, we could estimate if Leopard would be sufficient. So here you can see that even though the blue line which is the laeq for 60 minutes in for this two first show here the blue line is not exceeding 100. this engineer did a good job because uh, apparently because he he managed the dynamics of his show to end up exactly at 100 db now he still did spend the last 10 minutes at 103. so that we had to take into account so people are not going to stop 100 dB because they can mix, like for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they can mix at 106 if they've been mixing at a lower level before. So uh, we took this data and we did the math and, and, and realized that if we had had Leopard as predicted in map, which means in free field without the venue, without the acoustics, which will definitely, we would expect will help. Uh, if we had Leopard in free field as predicted in map, uh, the system would have limited about less than 10% of the time entered limitation in the past three or four years. So also we're like, okay, cool. We can put Leper in there. And then we have the data to prove it because the expectation was the first engineer that walks in will go, wow, the system, this system is too small. It's too tiny and it's not going to work. So we were ready for that. And then it turns out that everybody was super happy with this system, but that, that, that's one, one time this regulation helped us quantify if you were able to, uh, to 
move along with a new sound system in this venue. And so, um, hey, Amanda, are, are you, um, how's that going for you, a, a 100 dB constraint? Uh, how does that work? Is that I was a problem just about to you? ask you a question about that, and then I will answer your question. <laughs> okay. Um, how do you guys gauge getting this data and engage what was 100 dB between the left, right, and the actual crowd? Because every a lot of times I'm, you know, I, when I have a dB limit, I'm looking at it, and the crowd is like louder than yeah. the the limit. But yes. you know, it's like as if you know, <laughs> it's the PA, and it's not. So I'm I've always been curious as to how you guys gauge, especially if you're getting data like this in order to build out a system how are you able to gauge what was actually 100 dB? Was it the PA or the audience? Okay, so this is, this, is, this is where the average helps because the average smoothed out the audience. The audience is a, is a massive peak in general in between the songs. So okay. the, the other part of the coin is if, if I have a doubt on this graphic, this is a graphic I know is pretty solid, but if I have a doubt on this graphic, then I can go and listen to the show. <laughs> because we, we we have the recordings of every show, so if I have a doubt about the, the plot, I can go back and record, uh, listen to the recording, and be like, okay, I shouldn't take this into account because the crowd's been too loud, has been yelling at all, all the time during the show. So, um, so yeah, that's the luxury of having all the recordings. We can go back <laughs> to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I encourage making recordings because I have a, a mixing friend and he once got fined because a seagull was shouting in a measurement microphone. Oh, wow. And right. without, the rec without the recording, he, he would never be able to prove that because it was a concert next to the sea that it was a seagull. But because they yeah. had a recording, they went back to the recording and then you have a seagull doing mine into the microphone. And well, there you go. Well, what I, what I haven't been what I haven't said is the festival has its internal DB police. So the festival has its internal organization, and for us as engineers, as 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 guests, as as uh, front house engineers in the venues, uh, it's great help because we know that if things go out of control with a guitar amp or uh, or an engineer that doesn't want to comply, we can call them at soundcheck and have a discussion with it, with him or her or the production and. Uh, there's this layer where we can we can uh, get other people involved um, that are more precise in the description and 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 uh, and, and get people to comply. And the other the other side of the coin is the authorities. With time, the authorities are trusting us, uh, so that uh, it, see here in the end there was there was um, there was an over uh, they went at hundred. Uh, 0.5 and the the people there weren't fine because we could argue about why we exceeded the limit and so uh, the other side of the coin, we, we can talk to the authorities to just not take the data for granted we we can talk to them we can have a conversation sometimes we make mistakes sometimes we have crazy American that will mix too loud but um, it happens but I mean it, it, it in general we can always uh, discuss the issue prior or after so amanda um do you play with the set list depending on the the noise the, the noise restrictions the the sound limit is that something that you, you mean play, play with? with the set list well you know some some bands they they throw in a ballot before the encore so that they can oh, build gotcha. that can build up some credit so that they can finish with a bang is this something that you play with as a mixing engineer yeah I, I do keep that in mind the fact that like like jose just mentioned at the, the end of it was probably reaching about 105 i do keep in mind that the last song of uh janelle's set is like i said a rock song and she she can go 10 minutes on that song or she will go five so I have to keep that in mind that I need that leeway at the end of the show to um, to so that song can have the impact that it needs as being the closer. Um, so I if I do have a DB limit, um, I have just made a, a, a personal goal of just always keeping my show at 98 throughout the whole show. Um, 
and that has been one of the biggest challenges as a as a front of house engineer and going throughout my career trying to figure out how to just contain and keep a a good level a good dv level for my entire show keep it in mind of how you know however depending on if i'm with janelle that the end of the show is going it's just going to be loud i can't do anything (laughs) about it you know there's a live amp on stage is you know there's a clue you have to keep in mind that the acoustic sound of it all not just the pa but what's actually coming off the stage um does contribute to the db and everything so i i tried to cruise at 98 my entire show i may peak at 100 or 102 throughout but i try to keep a a good level at 98 is is it a loud stage or is it with with lots of leakage or is it well behaved no, it's pretty, it's pretty, we've gotten it to where it's, it's well behaved. It's really just a drum. What comes off the stage is a uh, guitar amp and the drum kit. And we, we, t- we, we've gotten it to where I could, it, it's controlled. There are no, there, there are a few side, there are two side fields because we have dancers, but they're not usually loud. We, um, I get a good balance of that with my monitor engineer, um, because the, it's really just so the uh, dancers can hear. So it's mainly tra- just our playback coming through the side field. So it's not, it doesn't add to the acoustic sound of what's coming off stage. Cool. Thank you. So what are cool. we looking at, Jose? Um, um, fans. <laughs> and now um, this, is the, this is the plan view of that venue. Uh, there's another trick where, that we use is we mix 1100s and 900s subwoofers. And the reason for that is we EQ, we filter the 1100s to be very deep. Um, and then we keep the 900s to bring, because the 900s have this dual coil uh, magnet that is super fast. So we keep super high level of of punch because they they will move very fast and extra low end of 1100 so we mix them in this in this place uh fairly good results and anyway we can place them anywhere else so they're under the stage uh so here you have predictions in the high frequencies um pretty straightforward this is the this is without processing all for the four microphones that are in the venue from front to back that's without processing and and just to show you that that's the same measurements of the same uh, place with the same positions, and so uh, I I couldn't resist to bring this picture. My good friend Fabrizio came over and mixed the show, and he wanted to listen to Leopard, and so he's listening he's listening to Leopard, and then uh, and I he commented about how good it was, blah blah, blah. and then I t- I told him you know that the EQs are bypassed. And so that's that's just the face he made. So I couldn't resist to add the picture if he was in case, just in case he would join. <laughs> that is the face of somebody that is trying not to show. Yes, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> definitely Fabrizio. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there we covered the entrance with a couple of U- UP juniors um, over there at the top. And this is the 900s. This is the 900s bringing power, and this is the 1100s, the reason why the 1100s are canted outwards is to push energy outside uh, because it's a wide venue. If you, look, if you look at the width of the stage compared to the width of the audience, um, and then we blend them together. Uh, we try to blend them together for, for a coverage as wide as possible in mixing these, these two key elements in frequency response or velocity or dynamics. Uh, in this venue. So that was the short visit of the Jazz Lab. Now we move to the Montreal Jazz Club, which is in a separate building now, and it's looking great. So that's the Montreal Jazz Club as it is now. It, well, it was in 2019. My favorite. Uh, couple chance you have you been there? No, but I've seen the photos, and I just okay. I love the, the 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 multiple you know delays and what well, you're going to show. I'm just going to show. Cool. <laughs> um, so this venue was planned to be slightly different this year and we, we have a couple of ideas to make it even better 
um, or more impressive, but that, that's, the, that's the venue as it is now. Uh, on the left side from the house, and the, and the first thing you'll notice is there's, uh, there's delay loudspeakers made of line rays, and um, it's very surprising for our guest engineers. <clears throat> uh, there's a couple reasons for that. The first reason is the club was first was uh, before was located within the building in a very low ceiling room. And this, uh, we had to find a very creative solutions that we felt was so interesting that when we moved to a bigger room, we wanted to keep. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this in the next slides. The other, the other element is we split the array because if you see the panels in the back with the, with the, with the logo, um, these panels were supposed to be a screen, uh, a curved screen. Now, a curved screen looked very good, but uh, we had to spend a lot of time explaining why a curved screen behind the stage wasn't such a good idea. And, uh, and finally was replaced by these uh, panels that are actually absorbing material. Um, but when the screen was, when we designed the venue, they wanted to have uh, the screen. So we wanted to, to keep the sight lines. That's the reason we split the array a little bit more uh, because we could keep the sight lines to the screen. So off of, of the side, we know that uh, the main array will be slightly on the screen, but if you move inwards uh, on axis of the arrays, uh, you your sight line is, is looking at the screens without obstruction. So the, here the PA is, is lit up so that we can see the loudspeakers, but what it, during the show, the speakers are, totally disappears because your image is anchored by the stage and the background of the stage. Um, so that's the old, what we call now the old club that was inside the building. Uh, that was the mood they wanted to establish. Uh, sitting, table sitting, uh, uh, service, uh, drinks, uh, our service. Cig cig cigarette uh, smoke? There is no, no. It would, have, it, would have, it would not have worked well because it's the same air conditioning as upstairs, but, uh, but it would have certainly added to the style. Um, but no, no cigarette, no cigars allowed in there. Um, yes, legally. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so uh, yeah, so it's a very low ceiling venue and was a lot of, uh, it was very complex designing this venue. We had to uh, scratch our heads a little bit because, because of the ceiling. Now you see, you can experience a show so close to the artist that even if you look at the artist, if the artist is moving to the front of the stage, he is standing in front of the PA. And there is a, <clears throat> there is a trick in this picture because the PA is aimed to avoid the, the, to avoid the stage on the, uh, on the horizontal axis that you, you, you can't figure out in this picture. So if, you, if, if, if it were a singer, you'd be like, wow, this is guaranteed feedback in, re in reality, the speakers are again aimed by tuning, and we, uh, uh, as the center in the Stravinsky, and we actually totally avoid the stage, even though the PA is behind. That's the only pickup point that we could use, and so it's it's anchored there. And if you look at the front in the, at the feet of the guitar player, there is a UPM that is filling the first tables. Uh, so this this picture is is a manipulation actually, but uh, it's a, it was a beautiful system it was a beautiful pa um and so the yeah here you can see and maybe recognize people in the front row uh this is mochiba playing uh in the club uh and the club so uh, it was 15 meters wide and 32 meters deep so on the left side uh, imagine you have 32 meters uh it's a tunnel uh, 2.6 meters high so uh the design for this venue was requiring if the blue dots are the main PA, it was require requiring a lot of delay lines, and the original idea was our original idea was to use UP4 slims or UPMs. That's uh, small speakers that uh, the company built, and is uh, is having a coverage angle of 100 degrees horizontally by 100 degrees vertically, um, and so. Um, we had to go to a theory that Bob McCarthy is explaining in, in his book about 
forward aspect ratio. And I had I spent a lot, a lot of time convincing people that even though the UPM was already a loudspeaker loud enough for this venue, uh, we needed to go one step above and use UP juniors because the, the coverage angle was reduced and the forward aspect ratio was more favorable. So I'll get into that, but then there's, I just wanted to, to add that there are um, subwoofers. So the, the uh, pink dots are subwoofers. Uh, also as cardioid elements adding power along the room. And the other thing is people in the front, in the front area where the tables are, get stereo off of each side of the venue. But people in the rake seating behind get stereo on each side. So actually, if you imagine <clears throat> that stereo only happens in the center or within two milliseconds of time of arrival between the speakers, if you sit here, you actually have a stereo image because your, your image is anchored by these two speakers. So this is left, uh, sorry, this is left, right, left, right. And so we could double, uh, almost double the stereo imaging, the, the, the amount of people experiencing stereo image by using this um, speaker layout. Uh, here's what what's the aspect ratio is doing. This is a 50 degree uh, loudspeaker in the vertical plane. So the green lines, these lines are showing the, um, the 50 degree coverage. So if you look at the point where the green line impacts the audience, we have a certain amount of level. Say we have 100 dB. Since we define the edge of coverage by the minus 6 dB point, now if I translate back to here, I gained 6 dB in power. Now if I double this distance here, I lost again 6 dB because I doubled the distance. So here now i know that this point here is at the exact same level than this point here and this line is the minimum variance line that we can get off of this speaker so if we have a very wide covering speaker then our minimum variance line is going to be super small meaning that we need a lot of steps in this in the venue especially if you have 32 meters to cover the whole venue this is why we changed to the UP Junior, which is way too powerful for this, for this place, because the UP Junior is doing 50 degrees, so we could have a longer throw and a better imaging into the, into the stage. So this is what happens when I, when I bring it down. And so this is the best coverage I have. So now, if I add the next speaker, this is defining this point here is defining where they overlap. This is defining the position of my next speaker. And so because the, we, had to, we had to make holes in the roof to pick up the speakers, this was the, the way we could do less uh, intrusion into the building. Uh, and in terms of price, it, the funny part is in terms of price, it was cheaper because we used less speakers. Otherwise, we, we should have had at least twice the amount of UPMs. So it was more practical. It, it, was, it, was, it looked crazy, but it was, it was much more practical. So this is the whole step. And you can see down below, this is, um, this is 3 dB per color divisions. And so you can see across the venue, we are within plus minus 3 dB of coverage. The craziest thing is you can sit under, under one of the speakers and your image is dead in front. So that was, the, that was all the thinking behind this design. And the good uh, byproduct of this is this, the audience is always very close to loudspeakers. So everything happens in the mix. You're not relying on the room. You're, you're always in direct sound. You, you, actually, the ratio between direct sound and reflected sound is so high that uh, we ha you have to load, well, we had to work a lot with reverbs. So you have to step up your game with reverbs because everything's happening in loudspeaker. You can't rely on the room, it's super dry. And so um, we wanted to keep these characteristics when we move into the, into the new club. This is why, this is, I was, as I was saying, this is one of the reasons why we have the delays, is we wanna have the people, we don't wanna have the people further than, I can't remember the name in English, but the, um, Reverb ratio when the reverb ratio increase over the direct sound. So we always want to have people 
get more direct sound than reverberated sound, especially in this room. So we made a massive effort of at absorption. Uh, actually, the 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 boat holes at the, on the floor on the ceiling, sorry, are absorbers. They are perforated and they are absorbers. Uh, curtains all around the venue and the RT60 for this venue right now is 0 0.88 uh, RT60 uh, and the floor noise is below 46 dB so the uh, incredible thing is the average level in this venue is below 90 dB even though we're limited to 100 the average level, and I mean, we had Corey Henry playing there, and we had serious people playing, but at some point, if it's too loud, it just gets too loud, and even even the artists are not playing that loud there. It's it's super quiet and super relaxed, um, so we can't. It's funny because even though we can go to 100 dB, almost nobody gets there. And the, at the beginning, we we felt the measuring system was broken, and it turned out it's not. It's just that the the noise floor and the dynamic range in the venue is so high that uh, people tend to mix much more quieter. Uh, it's, it's, so that's one thing. The other thing is comparison between consoles. So we have we have an SD12 with stadium preamps, and we have touring people showing up with plugins and consoles. They've been on the road for a long time, and immediately you hear you hear the noise floor of the console. You plug the console in. And, and and the engineer most of the time will go, what is this? And you go, well, I think it's, it's a noise floor of your console that we're hearing. Um, and so that was that was a surprise in a couple of cases. And the, the, the last thing is reverbs. Uh, reverbs are crucial uh, because otherwise it will sound so dry that it will be, it will be hard. It's, it's what I call the difference between making it sound loud and making it sound grand. <laughs> and that's and and you know making it <laughs> yeah it's like making it sound loud that's the easy part making it sound grand without being loud that's yeah you know. it's, well it's what good. what can i say this is this is my workplace right here so you, you wanted <laughs> to say something amanda i was just saying that's good i'm i'm gonna adopt that <laughs> <laughs> grand over loud um, grand <laughs> over loud power over glory <laughs> Awesome. So, Jose, you work a lot in this place, as you were saying, yes. in that venue. Well, actually, mix from the house in there when there's no engineer, touring engineer. That used to be a secret, but now it's over on YouTube. So, And the internet <laughs> does not forget. Yes. Um, did I admit you were saying the reverb was important for the old club or the newer one? Where you well, mix. both of them. Well, both of them because we translated. We tried to translate this this direct sound relationship from the old one to the new one by keeping the design uh, across. So, um, so that it turns out they're relevant. They're really important both uh, in both places. So, how do you approach that? Do you do you uh, approach it thinking of the timing of the reverb that you're using or the type of reverb? So it's a little bit of both. Um, we get wave plugins all over the place. So we uh, took the opportunity to take a couple of IRs of the Stravinsky. So Stravinsky, remember Stravinsky is a classical hall. Mm -hmm. So we, we took some IRs, so some impulse response of, the, of that venue and uh, made them into um, reverbs for more generic, you know, the IR on. One, for example, has only two knobs, more reverb, less reverb, <laughs> and then a little bit more delay or gain and then and then the mix so yeah it's three knobs actually but we use this as um, a set two of them so that we could use them as generic reverbs um say hey you want your room to sound more live then feed your mix into this or feed some elements of your mix into this yeah. so i preset some of that depending depending on places we have a lot of piano solos in this place and this is very practical because when you, you can pile up both you can pile up both reverbs and then uh, the, the beauty of it is you hear everything so you can be really detailed in, in all the all the settings you have in your reverbs yeah uh, so it's and, and I ended up, I ended up uh, using a lot of um, inserts so I'd bring a reverb as an insert into an instrument so that so oh, that cool. the, the instruments before going into the mix is already not too dry 
right. especially when we have saxophones or horns. Uh, also, you're like, wow, uh, yeah, I'd want to wet it a little bit. And so I'll, I'll run it through an engine as an insert on the channel before it, it, it uh, attacks, it, well, it goes into the, um, uh, the main mix. The, uh, the other, yeah, what, I, what I'm looking for, what I'm trying to get is more speakers in the room so I can use reverb <laughs> on this as surrounds and all of that. But, when um, you use it as an insert, do you adjust the mix on the reverb? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. So this is the predictions. This uh, this is a 3D view. I haven't done predictions yet in in in, a, in the 3D view. So this is the plan view now that you see. I'm adding the section view at the bottom, and as you can see, this is the main array. The main array is not covering the the rate sitting in the bar uh, in the end. So the mixing engineer doesn't hear the main array. And then we uh, add the arrays and the third delay is covering the sitting and the, the tribune. So, uh, so the, uh, the mixing engineer is right here. So the mixing engineer is looking at this um, speakers. The image is obviously right here with careful tuning. Um, so this, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward, but we make this delay speakers disappears, but it's super present when you mix. So, uh, so yeah, we have, I have near fields in front of house, but I don't use them because it's not, I use them for solo and line checks, but uh, not using, not using them for, uh, for shows. Um, this is subwoofer. So subwoofers, uh, there's a subwoofer array uh, here. You can see this subwoofer array of three 900s. There's not much space. So we place them in the roof. Um, and so the, the subwoofers on stage are an end fired array. The reason for that is we, we want to take advantage of the directivity of end fired arrays so that even though the subwoofers are placed on stage, they are not spilling on stage because they're canceling each other on stage, but they're adding in front. So uh, even though we don't have space to put them uh, in a straight line, vertical line, we put them in a horizontal line, but we still get the benefit of cancellation off axis of the line. So uh, now this is what you see here. This, these guys are hanging here behind the array. And this is what you get. And then we had cardioid elements. So one speaker is facing forward and the, under, and the other one underneath is facing uh, backwards. The other way around. The one under is facing forward and the upper one is facing backwards uh, as gradient uh, elements so that they not, they're not interacting with the speakers behind. So that's the first delay. That's second delay. And then there's uh, another element under the seating, exact just for that. So um, this extra subwoofers you can't see they're under the seating, but uh, they help bringing low end to. Actually, the, the subwoofers are decoupled in the tuning. They are decoupled from the main from the arrays because uh, it's a destination. Um, we measure at the destination, so we. The, these subwoofers are actually uh, timed to not to the subwoofers, but to the to the to the to the other array, which obviously makes sense. So that's a view of uh, the system. So we everything is put together, and there's this UPA. This UPA is doing an outfield for guests because the, we ended up having VIP guests on the side for people that like playing with end fire arrays. This array is non-linear. So the spacing between the subwoofer is not uh, the same between the boxes. Um, there's reason for, the reason for that is in, is in the directivity we want to achieve. So we're not using equal spacing just because so we can have more consolation on the side and in the back and more directivity to the front. That's the six linear NPA. The UPA is covering the sides. Um, that's view from the stage, a little blurry. But that's view from the stage, in front of the house out there, 600 seats, um, pretty nice seating. Pretty quiet room. And that's about it. This is the view from front of the house, ready to go for a show at 8 p.m. So you say, this is also the room where you do some mentoring, right? Yes, so I, I was about to mention the crew. Uh, that's, the, that's the crew here. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's been, a, 
it's, it was emotional last night because I was building these slides about the crew and remembering how we got there with this crew that can face probably anything now, uh, how, it, how it evolved emotionally and technically, how everybody evolved. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to pay a tribute to the crew because uh, th that's the crew of the club in the old club. Uh, that's all the people that are involved in lighting, production, audio, video. This is all the people that, that make it happen day after day, 16 days, uh, during 16 days in the festival, eight days before or three days before the set of the festival. We have the piano tuner uh, joining us on this picture. We have the jam sessions people that also use the stage uh, joining us. And so some of the people in this picture are issued of, of what, it wasn't called mentoring back in the day, but it is mentoring, is offering possibilities to people to join us in the crew and we identify people that would be super candidates to stay with us. And so this has been evolved, evolving um, with time. This is a video and this is just more tribute for them. I'm not going to name them, but this is the tribute for them. This is a changeover between two shows in the new club. And what you see here is a jazz, is a three piece jazz trio. And it's going to be replaced by, I think it's Chick Korea, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, so it's going to be replaced. That, what you're going to see in real time is taking 20 minutes. We clean up the whole thing. We bring everything else back in and then we line check everything. Uh, but now my friend Mela is going to say I should optimize screen for sharing video clips, which is done. And so I'm going to launch the video. So we just finished the show. Musicians are out. Uh, service lights. And that's everybody on stage at the same time. Uh, backliners. The piano tuner is ready with the piano behind, ready to step on stage. Everything is cleaned out. See the markings on the ground? That's where the equipment that is coming in is going to go. And so here's the piano and okay, piano tuner is arriving and he's gonna retune the piano before the show. Backliner is setting up all the percussions. And I think Laura started the, I think she started the line check already. Now rem this re remember, everything's recorded. So the, we, she, uh, Laura is in center now. She's line checking for all three consoles. Uh, so she's, she, she's in touch with uh, the three of us, monitor, uh, recording track and front of house and we all like land checking on the fly at the same time while everything else is happening. I feel like a fly on the wall. Yeah, you're, you're about the height. You can see on the right side, you can see the subwoofer. So you're hanging under the truss right next to the main uh, system. This makes me makes me miss work even more <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> well here's the good news it was not only the old crew it was also jose's old hairstyle <laughs> I love it. no i had cut my hair but uh, at the time already <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's definitely chick careers because the, the platform in the front is for uh, dancers um so that's it we're done, 20 minutes, ready to go. Um, so, and that's when we had a sound check. Now, they, there's a, sometimes Ben's arrives late and we, yeah, they just, everybody here is just amazing. And here we go. The announcer on the right is pacing. going on stage and it's that's the and the show starts yeah and that's the festival crew uh, we had the opportunity to invite the whole festival crew uh, to sit with john and helen so uh, that's all the audio crew for the whole for almost all the audio crew for the whole festival and if you look uh at some people you can see they wear microphones uh this is in between sound check and show so this is a half hour uh this is a half hour hour stop in the day between uh, loading, sound check, 
shows and uh, load out. So um, that was a half hour break that we could we could all gather together and then and then move on to to the rest of the show. And so, uh, big credits to everyone here because um, it's uh, it's it's be it became a family, and um, and uh, yeah, we're all very supportive for, of of each other, of each other. So uh, so it's great. Just wanted to thank you everybody in this crew. I can't name everyone, but um, just want to thank everyone. Um, and as I said, so some people here are issued of mentoring. We opened the, the, the possibilities. Uh, in fact, this year we offered uh, to a group that is called Women in Live Music. We offered a, a um, one day with, with my crew so they could join my crew for a day and, and stay with us the whole day and experience the, the magic or the unmagic of what we do. Um, during the full day, and, and it, it was a great experience. I hope it has a, it will be a fruitful experience for everyone involved. And uh, so, yeah, now I want to I'll bring back to Amanda because we know Amanda is doing a lot of mentoring, and we're trying to get at uh, her to speak about the mentoring she's been doing. And also, Amanda, if you could add, what your what are you up to in the next um, month? Um, yeah, a couple of years ago, I had the idea to. Um, invite four to seven girls to um, just hang out with me during sound check and during um, day of show type deal to just give exposure because when I first started that just wasn't an option for me I had to just dive in and learn on the job as I as I went and and grew in my career and and traveled with uh janelle but um i started this initiative uh line check women in live production and i just focused it on uh girls who were interested in audio as well as production uh management and allow some people to talk to them about tour management as well because some girls were interested in that as well and we just you know, hung out. Janelle was very supportive of it and uh, allowed them to see her in a in a vulnerable state because we know sound check is not always the best for rest presentation for the artist. So I, I really appreciate her for allowing me to do that. But um, the girls, you know, I would take them on stage and show them our setup and, uh, you know, what is a stage box? Because, you know, when I first started, I I had, had no idea what that was, you know, a stage box, a snake, um, a splitter, all these things that, you know, just um, the language and the terminology, um, sharing that with them as well, not just coming to see, you know, a Janelle Monet performance. It was uh, developed to help these girls learn and expose them to the fact that this is a viable career that they can pursue and, uh, and, and do well at it. Awesome. So, so you're, you're really paving the way for others. And, and, um, and it's my understanding that um, within the foreseeable future, you're going to do a webinar for women's audio mission. Yes. Um, that is on July 25th at 4 15 central time i'm doing a WAMCON, as they call it women's audio mission uh probably do like a 30 minute uh presentation and also before that july 10th i'm doing a webinar with digico um called ask me anything so with that title i guess you can ask me <laughs> anything <laughs> well if, if, um, if those are if, two things i have coming up if our female audience wants to get in touch with you, are there ways that they can reach out to you? Is there, is there, are there, are there avenues? Yes. Uh, I'm not too big on social media, so I only have Instagram, which is the T H E E Amanda Renee, R E N E E. Um, you can DM me there. I do not have a private account. I, try to answer and respond to everyone that usually hits me up um yeah you can reach out to me there or through sound girls carrie and i have a a great relationship she usually um you know emails me whenever someone <laughs> yes <laughs> whenever someone um you know is reaching out or trying to get in touch with me you can i'm on their their list too i think my email is there so either one of those 
I'm very open and want to help anyone that I can. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, you said ask questions. So Jose has some uh, slides that we can maybe look at while we open up the chat for, for, for Q&A with everyone's uh, consent. So uh, during the call... Exactly the plan. That's exactly the plan. So any questions we're happy to take? Uh, the slides that are going to go is all the venues that I haven't talked about. So this is the what's happening around the festival. That's what's going to display. Awesome. So I was monitoring the chat um, during the call and um, somebody asked, do you bring your own console or do you make use of the house console? Um, for Montreal last year, we were um, on tour. So that was, uh, we brought our in our own consoles and everything but uh, a lot of times we are doing one-offs and I use what's there but I would request the same console is I'm not usually just hopping on a console and and build it from scratch that would be a total nightmare and uh, so I usually request my SD12 so I can load my file and have a good starting point but for Montreal last year we I was on a, a touring console that we were on for a couple months. Understood. And then uh, my other eye is keeping track of, of Facebook and somebody answered um, and uh, uh, was questioning, um, what program do you use to tune? Do you work by ear or, 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 or do you use any tools um, during your, your voicing, your, your calibration, your tuning process? Me or Jose? <laughs> uh, no, I, I'd like to think that this, that this is uh, directed to you, to Amanda. Okay. <laughs> um, I use my ears, honestly. Um, I, over the years, I've developed a recognition of certain frequencies that I already know that probably need to be dipped out. Uh, depending on um, when I listen, to, play the Mayor Hawthorne song and listen to the PA, I automatic when I first hear it and use it, you know, the EQ is flat. Um, there's usually, I'm usually know when I'm in a certain room, what frequency I'm going to need to dip out. So I go ahead and do that. Also, um, and uh, I have an RT analyzer on my phone for when I ring out the, uh, the microphone. So um, yeah. Those are my two tools, my ears and <laughs> RT analyzer on my phone. Um, I had a teacher at SAE uh, like 10 years ago. He always told us not to engineer, need to engineer. So I use my ears. I think that's very, very uh, proper advice. Uh, <laughs> I think somebody picked that line. <laughs> right. Um, so if anyone has a question for Amanda or Jose, uh, please make use of the chat. I think we have two, two, two to three more minutes uh, for questions. If not, uh, then we're going to finish up with some remaining household notes. So please make use of the chat um, for any questions. I had a question for <laughs> Jose. Um, you're saying you it's eight hours of tuning. Do you give yourself a rest? How do you maintain the keenness of what you need as far as your ears to uh, to tune properly? In in the tuning process? Yes. Um, so do you go to... all the way through eight hours, or do you like? Well, eight hours of time window I have, usually it's just less than that, but uh, usually eight hours of time window I can get. Okay. Um, the, the reason, um, well, <clears throat> so first, remember in the process, we are lucky enough to be able to change the mechanical properties of the array. So there's a lot of it that is part with verification. So you, you, you measure the PA, You'd say, okay, this is this is what I want to change in the mechanical properties. Not the angles, general. The angles were pretty pretty used to, but it's just the uh, the, the the angling. I'm not trusting 100% the inclinometers on top of the grid. I'm happy to have them, but uh, my goal is not having. That's me. What happened? <laughs> 
That's me. That's the Zoom police. Sorry. Okay. Did I do something wrong? No, you didn't do anything wrong. It's just I love watching you when you're talking. Okay. <laughs> Uh, busted by the okay so this is where i can say that you're the um, zoom officer right <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what was i saying um yeah so we work on mechanical properties this we take time because we want to uh i trust in climbers to get in the right place in the right ballpark but then uh i'm I, it's the results thing i want to make sure that if the angling is a little bit off or the uh, the height is a little bit off. I want to make sure that at 40 meters across the venue, uh, I'm not hitting a wall that I want, don't want to eat the hit. So this is why I opened this big window because so that makes for a lot of breaks because you take a measurement and then you make a change and then you measure again yeah. and you make a change. We also have breaks. We also put breaks in because yeah, you want to have a break and eat food and. Um, uh, so there's a, there's a bunch of breaks. Uh, I use I use seam for tuning. Uh, in general, lower level. If if it's not voicing, if if it's not EQing, I'm, I'm using lower level stuff for timing. And I, I try to keep lower level level quite low. I uh, also use earplugs. So when I'm, when when not necessary, because I'm used to my process in general is to make a decision with seam and then play music and go and listen to it. So it's a step-by-step -step process rather than do the whole thing with team and then play a track and go, oh no, I want to change this small tiny element, but if I change yeah. it, it has an effect on all the others. So I would, I would, I would make a decision using, using an analyzer and then listen to if my decision is making sense to me and my ears. So protection, measurement, decision, Take protection out, play music. Okay, this is cool. This is not cool. Okay, this is what I want to investigate now with my analyzer uh, or not. And then next step. So uh, I build a strategy. Where, where do I want to start? Where do I want to end? What's the what's my my starting uh, my starting state and what's my end state? Uh, and um, and I go from there. So <clears throat> um, in general, I use protection when I play ping noise. And then, uh, so I lowered the, 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 the pressure on the ears and then and I go there. But, so, but there is no, uh, there's no secret. Over time, you get worn out when you finish yeah. retuning, retuning like eight venues. Um, so it is, there's actually two people uh, doing the tuning. So we, uh, we split the load. And um, so I'm not doing all 11 venues, but I'm probably doing six. Uh, so there's no, uh, there's no secret. You ended up worn out. And... Uh, Starting mixing is hard because uh, you're tired. So uh, but that, that has all to do with health, staying healthy. So uh, sleeping enough, adjusting your sleep schedule, uh, getting food and right timing. This is stuff we do all year long because we at Meyer because we travel all the time. So so keeping the, your body clock running in, in 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 good shape is something we do all year long. So and this is this is pushed to the extreme in these conditions. Uh, not only in the in, in hearing, but but in the whole uh, uh, physical sense. So yeah, I lose some weight during the during the first two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think we have a wonderful question in closing. It's not an easy one. It's a question for Amanda. But in closing, I think we have a wonderful question. And Jeff says, "Hey Amanda, I'm a big fan of your work. Nice. What is your favorite Janelle song to mix?" <laughs> That is uh, my good friend, but also Janelle's tour and production manager. I'm going to call him out. <laughs> um, my favorite song to mix of Janelle. Um, our full show is this song called Don't Judge Me. Um, but when we're doing festivals, it's the, it's the first song, Classic Life. I can't... I, I, as I said before, I can't remember the names of things, <laughs> but uh, it's some like classic life or something like that, because it's just a, uh, I don't know, it, it gives, it's, it's space, because at, at the top of the show, at the top of the song, it's just her voice and guitar, so it's cool, I like to do a lot of like delay throws and stuff like that, um, and then it's just a solid like in the pocket song, so it's cool to like to to you know the simplest things are always the hardest things so it's cool to to make sure and to see 
and to mix something that is, you know, so simple, but to have, you know, to bring out every element and be able to crazy classic life. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> you see classic life is the name of the song. Um, yeah, I like to, I, I really like to mix that song. Excellent. Well, unless you have anything to say to your audience, um, I motion to adjourn. I just, I'm grateful for doing this and thanks everyone involved at that asked me to do this to Jane and everyone at Meyer. They've been really cool towards me and welcoming and it's just, it's really cool to do this and to, to get all the history uh, of the festival from Jose was really cool. Um, the mm -hmm. guy on the poster, on the very first, per first poster, Charles Lloyd, is from Memphis, actually. And that's where I'm from and where I am right now. So it was cool to, to make that connection. Nice. Excellent. Well, I'm, glad you, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. Um, thank you for being with us because it was, it was great insight. It's funny because it's, it's one of the best feedback I ever got <laughs> from somebody that mixed at the festival because everybody's happy. They're just happy. But we get we got a lot of insight and it's great. Thank you very much for for taking the time to be with us because we I also know you're in a session. <laughs> well, I'm session. on my way to one, yes. <laughs> yeah. And we're using your time because I promised it would be one hour and two hours. <laughs> well, I'm ha I'm happy to give this time. It was great. Agreed. Agreed. So Jose, I've got a couple of household notes um, in closing. Um, okay, so um, uh, we can let Amanda go. Is that what you mean? Um, well, I just wanted to thank Amanda, like you already did. Thank you for doing this. But I also want to thank you. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, without you, we, you know, we wouldn't have the fortune of having today's wonderful case study of the Montreux Jazz Festival. And that means that, as always, a recording of today's webinar can be found within the next couple of hours or so uh, on our YouTube Thinking Sound channel, Meyer Sound's Thinking Sound channel. And that means that, um, as for upcoming webinars, uh, next Monday we will be doing, uh, due to popular demand, we will be doing a live rerun of the Autosplay webinar where we talk about Autosplay in MapXT. And all that's left to do for me is to say, Please stay safe. Please stay healthy, everyone. Best to you and your loved ones. And hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.